we'll get going. Um, and I want to thank everyone who is here so far and who will join us. I'm Chuck Wolf. I have been involved with the Center for the Future of Places at the Royal Institute of Technology at KQH for the last three or four years through the good graces of Tigran, who you'll meet in a second. Um, I've been a visiting scholar and now I'm a guest affiliate. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, again, for those of you who arrived late, um, the conversation is being recorded today, which I'm compelled to tell you based on EU and UK requirements. Um, so today we're going to be um, talking about place and we're going to be talking about place in a way that maybe is a little bit different than the many, many, many conversations that are going on about inclusive emergence from the pandemic. Um, it may look like we're talking about two dimensional places and the architecture thereof, but the idea is to go way beyond that and to think of place as an amalgam of um, many, many disciplines and uh, engage in a dialogue in terms of how much we can do as we say emerge from the pandemic or during any uh, period of urban change, which is like all the time to really understand a place. We can go from the most simple tactical urbanism to a very, very much of a deep dive. And the question is, what's the right mix? What's the most inclusive? What's the most equitable? What takes in the built natural, cultural, and um, other environments that um, that key a city? Now, Doug Kelbaugh is with us. He um, um, is a bit of a hero with regard to his article in the late uh, 60s, or I believe it was six, eight, Doug can correct me, but it, about the many types of urbanisms, maybe it was a bit later, but yeah. 90s actually, 90s. And it opened the door to this idea that urbanism is not just one thing. There's a there's a relation, direct relationship between the neighborhood and perhaps a much larger regional set of systems that is beyond the city. And that is embedded in this discussion. We have a new book. I'd be remiss not to talk about it, not because it's mine and Tigran's, but it's a product of center funding. And um, if you're interested, you can get it pretty much everywhere. We've had some supply chain glitches, but just look for it at your place of choice and you will find it. Um, it's called Sustaining a City's Culture and Character. And it's the product of the Cities in Context project that I uh, essentially was the PI for during my time at the center. Thanks to Tigran, it is essentially the capstone of my own urbanism trilogy. And um, it takes concepts that I sort of was learning on the job as I was becoming a recovering attorney uh, from and um, takes them to a very high level of immersion. And for those of you uh, like Shannon, who has been very, very, very nice to read the book and so on, um, you also know that it tries to be quite practical. I start out always in my writing and, you know, my writing does benefit from my time, my 34 years as an attorney on the ground uh, with a realization that at some level places are kind of the same. Um, they have the same human, human environmental relationships that go into them. This is not rocket science especially to anyone who thinks deeply about these issues. But I always like to start whatever book or whatever talk I'm giving with this fundamental comparison of Arisha, Tanzania and Seattle, Washington, home of Starbucks and so on and so forth. And for short form, for an introduction to a panel, I'll leave it plain and simple. This is the same place across the world. If you break down the elements that build the place, it's infrastructure, it's weather, it's um, down to the woman with the smartphone in front of the commercial setting. And I think it's instructive to remember that for reasons that we'll get into throughout today. My second book, which brought Tigran and me together was um, called Seeing the Better City. And it was actually a guide to everyone in terms of how to understand the places in which they live worked and visited. And the idea was that uh, a more visual dialogue might um, allow for a more meaningful inclusion in deciding how places should change. For that, I go right to Stockholm and, um, in Ostermalm, and we see sort of the posh side to the left and the universal issues of our cities to the right. Enough said. 
When we talk about the better city, who are we talking about? And if I go back to my hometown of Seattle, I received something from my father who was, as Doug and others know, a fairly well-known urban design and planning professor. And he had a graphic in his lectures that um, with this statement, it all depends on who's looking and what and from which angle. And when I was still back in Seattle four and five years ago, really working this issue both as a lawyer and beginning to be something else, I would show people these things like, you think you don't like multifamily dwellings? You think you want single family dwellings? Look a look at this. That's a, that's a sixplex to the left and a single family home to the right. And the single family home is used exclusively for the storage of plumbing parts by landlords. And the sixplex looks like a single family home. So this again goes to the multiplicity and the complexity of our environment. Same issue about the homeless in a public space with a view and the right to a view and so on and so forth. So when we started work on this book, Tigger and I all sorts of fancy ideas. Oh, we're gonna look at all the rankings, Mercer, Monocle, The Economist, and we're gonna say that the cities are that are truest to their context are the most successful. Bye. And um, the answer was that's way too simplistic a premise. We're never going to be able to come up with a context index and prove anything because um, we'll, we'll leave that for another time. And so we embarked on a more qualitative analysis that looked at layered neighborhoods such as here in East London, over tourism and the impact on, on the built and natural environment such as Venice. And we began to come up with, although this is not in the book, this is to the right, a development of my friend and former client in Seattle, uh, Liz Dunn, which is the real Melbourne Laneway. And I've already given it away. The real Melbourne Laneway is the one on the right, but Liz did a very skillful job in Chop House Row in emulating that. Is that okay? This laneway had nothing really to do with the, addition, the original site in Seattle. These are the kinds of things we wanted to start deconstructing. Same with the um, Umbrella Sky Project, which has become a very successful placemaking tool around the world. Um, in a hill town in Italy on the left, in Paris on the right, in um, Terminal 5 at Heathrow before the pandemic. Why does this stuff catch on? Of course, this is a very affordable means of, of place making, as someone has pointed out. But does it matter? Should we be holier than thou about whether there needs to be a fit between um, a concept and, and a place? Natural climate change issues. Here in Stockholm, there's a national park in the middle of the city, as many of you know. In London, there is equivalence in, in Paris here. Mayor Hidalgo, as part of her re-election campaign on a wide range of initiatives, including the 15-minute city, has a whole urban greening process underway in these two photos. Um, the issue of green space is contextual, and it expresses itself in different ways. And who's to say which is right and which is wrong and whether it matters? So there's this other issue, top up, bottom down, or co-creation where the two shall meet. How much of a voice should locals have in the redevelopment of their neighborhoods? Who owns the city? All of the contemporary social justice, uh, just sustainability issues as Professor a Averman likes to parlay. Quick mention on the left is in Melbourne, the Cremorne neighborhood, a, a co-creation group is educating or has been educating um, new tech businesses and government in terms of a hub that it is redeveloping an old greedy neighborhood and what matters in that neighborhood and how to retain it. And we have these expressions of culture in Porto and in Kensington and London. Where does this all fit in and who decides what stays and what goes? Just the developer? I don't think so. So um, very presciently, right before the pandemic, we wrote this. Imagine if the city around you disappeared. How would you recreate? your paths and all of the things you're used to. Well, this became a bit of the challenge of the pandemic, didn't it? And um, this is in the introduction to the book and hence part of the, um, part of the project that we're um, involved in. 
And um, when we begin to break things down and we talk about words like authenticity and character without, without acknowledging setting in a modern add-on and say, well, that 80s era add-on to a 12th century church just sucks, doesn't it? Well, maybe not. Um, maybe it had a role. Maybe it mattered at the time. We can't simply say that the character, at least I would say, this is not just a heritage exercise or in the U.S. Uh, and historic <laughs> preservation exercise. We can't simply use words to get to the bottom of what we're talking about. Even if you talk about the pandemic and how we get out of it, well, hey, just behind that church is a plague pit. We've been there before. Here to the right um, is our house in Newbury, West Berkshire, England, to the rear in 1918 with a bunch of people in front of shops that no longer exist. If you look closely, they're all wearing masks. Why? It was flu epidemic and pandemic time. So we break down these words. Um, people who know a lot more than I do about this subject, Rob Cowan, leading urban design trainer here in the UK, um, Richard Guys, a number of others, um, Kim Davi, Daria Okte. We know we're talking about a sem an assemblage and that's where we get to the panelists today because they, they all provide different elements of the assemblage. And when I began to write the book, I started doing mock-ups like this. And I'd say, okay, look at this building in, in, in Richmond, in, in the town center of Richmond upon Thames. And what are the different aspects of the assemblage that are expressed right here? And this has been my adventure for the last couple of years. Came up with an idealistic methodology to help people do a deep dive. And this is where for the the um, war on cars and uh, uh, tactical urbanists and so on and so forth, I get way too academic because that's part of my nature. But I come up with a methodology, look, engage, assess, review, and negotiate using the context keys of uh, familiarity, congruity, and integrity. It's a guide. It's a guide through the assemblage. And the book is full of this kind of stuff, won't bore you with it here. It's full of methods ranging from um, conventional methods, conventional things that people do, all the way to uh, more modern data-driven, data mining, citizen science analysis. We look at something like this, is this a blight on character? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. How about at King's Cross? as a symbol of the redevelopment um, areas around the world, just like Stockholm's uh, um, Royal Seaport with apartments and gas holders and re redevelopment of um, historic industrial facilities. A blend, this is all about blends. It's all about contested terms. It's all about everything I've said so far. Is this a good project? Is this a bad project? You know, depends on who's looking at what from which angle. The book has about six case studies, and I'm not going to go into them, but I'm going to give one word that, uh, that, that applies to each. The left, Kiruna in Lapland in northern Sweden. Moving a city pioneered by Tigran's former colleague, Professor Jaren Karsh. What do you take with from an old town center that's subsiding due to mining to a new town center? Do you take a whole building? Do you take a piece of it? Do you take vegetation? Do you take materials? It's a fascinating exercise. They had the luxury of sitting down and talking to people for some years and a mining company paying for the relocation. But boy, is that a learning lab on how to do things right in times of urban change. Um, the Irish Pavilion's contribution in the 2019 Architecture Biennale in Venice free space about reclaiming the DNA of Irish market towns on the lower left. Six very talented young architects who I went and immersed with to understand. Uh, the Bloomberg European headquarters in London, restoring Roman ruins to their rightful place underneath, re-enabling the, um, the oldest street in London. 
Um, this is a Foster and Partners project um, that won a lot of architectural awards, but the contextual approach of this high-end project um, leaves us a lot to learn from. Um, over to the right, uh, the Lower Marsh Business Improvement District in London near Waterloo uh, called We Are Waterloo has done amazing things in a comprehensive way to re-realize that part of the city. And these two on the, um, the middle right and the, and the top are Apple projects that failed in Stockholm and Melbourne. Apple Town Square projects, quite different than the contextual approach that actually Foster is taking on the Via del Corso in Rome right now. Why? They didn't do their homework. They didn't learn the place. And there's a lot to learn, no pun intended, from people who don't quite get it right. And so I'm going to conclude with some opportunities in a place like Bristol here in the UK that um, is there's a there's a essentially an old bomb hole that had some bank buildings on it and still has a ruined church that is being revisioned. It's an absolute candidate based on all the cultural inputs into Bristol and the long term um, mixed populations and so on and so forth. It's an absolute invitation for the type of process I'm talking about. Unfortunately, the current, um, I think, the current um, a uh, uh, proposal that's out for comment looks at maybe a bit too much like King's Cross for its own good without enough local input and listening. Um, and then finally, a little bit of Banksy, the graffiti artist, to remind us that these are not bright black and white propositions. They're not even necessarily high-minded professional propositions. A final piece of learning about a fruit delivery company in London that stayed virtual and is very successful. Some may say, what a shame, they don't have their fruit stalls anymore. But guess what? They're headquartered, they're warehoused in a railway arch. They provide the same customer service they always have to the neighborhoods they've always served. They're the same family. They used to go to offices. They amped up to residences during the pandemic. Some may say, hmm, is that a blight on the, a, bl a blight or an impact on the high street, on the main street, on, festival markets. Maybe it is, but maybe it's the integrated future that we need to look very hard at. So that's my contribution. I'm going to unshare and thank you for listening. We're going to mix it up with the panel right now and run around um, with a set of questions based on this um, to honor um, the nature of the book and the nature of the work we've been doing the last three years and to honor the um, the all the work the uh, panelists have been doing out there on similar terms. Okay, so we've we've talked about an idealistic method. We've talked about um, contested terms, about blends, about all of the above. From each of your perspectives, what's the best way to understand an urban place? Five minutes apiece. Cara, Doctor Cara Courage, what do you think? Um, I always walk a place. For me personally, walk it is a, the first thing I do whenever I arrive somewhere. Um, and in my own practice, I have various different walking methodologies, but to walk the place with people in time is the best thing to do as well. You get a really good psychogeography and history and a real sense of their belonging and place attachment and what resonates with them. And I think that that points to really what I would put behind this is that, and, and this is something that is really um, the golden thread of everything that I do, is that putting the community as the experts in their own place. And I didn't coin that phrase myself, it came from the incredible placemaking or place-based artist, Jana Van Hiesick. And the community is the expert in, her, in their own lives, as she said. Um, and so for me as a placemaker, I come in with various different skills as does a planner, an architect, a landscape architect, whoever may be around that particular place stable. Um, but the community is the expert in being the community. And um, you can, for me, placemaking, as soon as you take that community aspect out, it loses any radical potential that it has inherent in it. So for me, the best way to understand it is, is through listening 
uh, to people that are there to learning through you know the, the lens of their own eyes and their perspective of it as well um and I, I've you know working with artists I've worked with artists that are that have been embedded in projects for years and years and years and also artists that um might just have three months to get something done that's the funded term everybody you know we, we can all understand those kind of parameters um but working with them to help understand place it's it's really something i have noticed you don't have to be from that place but to have an understanding of a similar type of place this sensibility is really helpful um and also uh to, and you know so you're not just sort of splashing into somewhere and then going out and you know off we go so you know, ways to get embedded in that sense um, would certainly be also for me a way to understand urban place. I think that's, no, I think that's a great, um, I think that's a great analysis and very consistent with, you know, much of what we came up with. I must mention that again, um, Cara was too humble in her definition. I mean, she and other co-editors have produced a rather massive guide to placemaking from Routledge that is one of the first efforts to sort of comprehensively dissect that term and look at um, many, many different aspects of placemaking, not just um, some of the um, standard um, practices that we're aware of in all of our communities around the world. So um, Shannon, you, um, you come in from a slightly different perspective, but you know how to figure out a place as well as anyone I know. So uh, well, what's your best, best way? Thank you, Chuck. Uh, I love feeling intimidated by um, how much there is to learn about each place. And um, our charge is to develop the best understanding we can, um, not only of, of what's there in the landscape, whether we're designing a park or a plaza or a piece of sidewalk, um, we come in as, um, people who first try to help everyone see together clearly the current physical condition of the landscape. There's a funny thing with landscape, I'd say, as opposed to architecture and other aspects of the built environment, that we tend to kind of take it for granted and almost assume it's natural. Even if you know there's an area in town that might not be very walkable and it feels like a dead end because there's a rail corridor or something, you almost feel like it's like geological and it's always been that way. So we try to bring to the surface that um, let's, let's look this squarely in the eyes and then understand that this is the result of a series of choices and changes that have been made to this landscape over time on most of the kinds of sites and places that we work in. So we use, um, I use drawing to help illustrate that, illustrate the things that we can't see when we look at the landscape, which is for instance, recent decades of change, the landscape used to look like this. There used to be an intersection every block and a person could walk across the street every block here. Now there's this modern road hierarchy that makes this area feel unwalkable. So sometimes drawings and cartoons can help simplify that story and help people see how dynamic and how much the landscape's been changed and thus how much we can change it again for the better. Um, and then the second uh, sort of chapter of that, if I'm summarizing that process of trying to get to know the landscape and just see it clearly and, and involve the community in that, um, is to draw what we can't see, draw this invisible landscape that in, it exists everywhere. It's the daily patterns the daily patterns that both happen every day in the local community. How do people move? How are people going between their home and school or their home and their daily errands? And then how would they be moving if the landscape was actually etching that in the way that it, it should? If, for instance, um, traffic patterns weren't preventing that from happening. So the other kinds of drawings and cartoons that I often do is, um, uh, these sort of diagrams of if the voices of the community, the stories that are here in the landscape and the way people would live as human beings um, were physically expressed or marked in the landscape, what would that landscape look like? And a lot of times it's a finer grained 
more eclectic um, and more interesting place. And then suddenly, you know, usually um, we all see the potential um, for a very interesting physical landscape design that simply comes from uh, seeing and, and talking about what happens every day, as opposed to importing some kind of spectacular um, novel form or um, uh, monumental physical idea that comes from elsewhere. Hopefully that made right. some sense. Usually I show no, pictures no, I when I talk about that. <laughs> No, no, I did. And Shannon, you and I have talked about this before, but I think this is really key to the exercise. Um, being quite aware from my past life of people's commercial motivations sometimes. Now, you go into this with almost every client, as you explained to me, you play this role in your firm. But I'll sound like the lawyer here. Isn't it true that some of your discoveries aren't intended to be necessarily and products in a new design. You sort of just said that. I think you just said, we we don't need to have the ceremonial water feature just because we've discovered there was once a lake here, right? Um, Absolutely. In fact, it's really important to get into the mode um, of, it's a humble mode, and it's also just, let's relax for a little bit and take this all in. It's going to be too much. Don't like look at everything for its potential to be physically represented in the landscape. Let's just absorb, listen together. And the most important thing that comes from that is developing a shared intuition between members of the design team, but also members of the community that are involved. There's this, most people I find kind of, um, you, there's something going on in the background of your mind when you're talking about all these specific literal things that you start to develop a shared intuition for a kind of character of the place and, and functional behavior and tendency that is distinct. And sometimes it can be hard to put it into words or pictures, but it gives you a sense of what's appropriate and, and what's living in the air there, I guess. Um, right. And I hope to be sort of cast under that spell as a designer so that I might not be literally representing every historic feature that we find, but I'll feel more confident that I'll, I'll be appropriate in, in what I'm designing. Right, thank you. So Manish, your turn. Uh, wow, that's a, that's a loaded question, Chuck. Uh, I'm 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 still learning how to understand the urban uh, the urban or an urban place, right? Because urban is so complex and fascinating; it conceals more than it reveals. Uh, not readily decipherable in all its complexity. So, my understanding of urban has been shaped by many urbanists uh, and cultural geographers. Uh, you know, ranging, and I've used methodologies ranging from the more prescriptive to the more immersive. And uh, just to give a quick rundown, uh, you know, I've been inspired by, of course, like all designers and planners, Kevin Lynch, uh, you know, Image of the City, Grady Clay, How to Read an American City, of course, James Jacobs, uh, just observation of street life, perhaps, you know, what was termed as eyes on the streets while sipping coffee in a cafe that spills out on the on the street that's powerful you just sit and observe uh, how how people go about in the practice of everyday life also william white uh, who you know shows us how to you know understand uh, spaces within spaces and how people use spaces in his work on the social life of small urban spaces and your own urban diaries and seeing the better city and now more tools so so I, I, I draw my understanding at, I was thinking about it, I draw my understanding primarily at two levels. One of course is the bird's eye view, which uh, relies on uh, the big data, uh, you know, digital mapping, uh, simulated street views that you and Tigran have argued in your book that does not provide a complete picture. And I fully agree, and, but it's a good start. It gives you the lay of the land. You, you, know, what, you know what you're getting into. And the second way I understand the urban is quite unplanned. 
It's more immersive. It's, you know, on the ground explorations, aimless wandering around, or sometimes with maps, other times without maps, talking with people, observing how people shape their built environments and how it reflects their hopes, aspirations, dreams, you know, also noting the fractures and disparities and inequities in the in the urban setting, you know, because everything that you're going to be seeing is all, it's not going to be all rosy and good. You know, you're going to see all the fractures uh, and uh, an authentic place, authentic is a powerful word, but it is not uh, always, uh, you know, rosy and great and good. It, it, it contains right. good, bad and ugly, everything, right? So there is power right. in the authentic places uh, that are fast disappearing in favor of manufactured urbanism. So. Uh, just to put a stop here. So those are the two levels in which I, I try to understand that. As you know, they're nested and they uh, inform each other. Yeah, thank you so much because your background, I think, is, is very a very special one um, given um, your expertise, um, you know, essentially in the global south and also, you know, heritage and um, urban design and all of the things that you've alluded to. And your book with Jeff, Messy City, um, took took a lot of this on as well and so um that's why you're back again for, for your second <laughs> uh, anyway so um follow-up question thank you um to each of you on that but the follow-up question is um is really um Cara I think again we'll lead with you because this speaks to your your point about the voices of of, of the residents and the people and and so on um Co-creation is a word that I used in my brief introduction, and it's a word that's thrown around a lot these days. Um, do you? I'm going to actually. I think I'm going to combine. I'm going to combine the next two questions because it'll help us time wise. So there's co-creation, and I was going to ask: Is that just a trendy term, or does it really mean something? And how can we help it mean something with our governmental structures and our input? mechanisms post pandemic but secondly i'm going to merge it with the next question because it um, um it speaks to what manish just said i mean manufactured urbanism if co-creation finds that you know there there's a truly immersive undertaking between top make it government or a developer and what we might call bottom, unfortunately, people who live or people who have had lesser of a voice, if it results in one of these manufactured urbanism solutions, even though it's amid a Roman ruin or, a, or, 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 or some classical urban landscape, is that a bad thing? I mean, if, if today's reality is something entirely different than the bones of a place what do we do with that and 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 so you know i those umbrellas uh the melbourne laneway in seattle uh, if the, if co-creation leads us to that result is that okay uh, what are we looking for here god that's huge um places are always changing of course nothing is set in aspect in that way and um, you do get, and I'm speaking to what Shannon was saying as well, you know, there's a certain kind of nostalgia that you can get with a certain type of placemaking and that fixes a place in a point, of, in, a point in time. And um, I wouldn't say that was necessarily always a good thing. I've also, and this is, God, this was something that was said to me years ago. I was working with um, Big Car in Indianapolis one of the areas that they went into first, usual story, artists took over a derelict department store, reanimated it. Then suddenly, you know, from downtown comes this wave of gentrification. Um, and they, they'd had, they, you know, big cars and organization put various different things in place to, to try and keep um, the more commercial aspects of that out. But that's another story. But what somebody did say in the area was, I can get a good cup of coffee at last. And that was a really important thing. And that's a really, you know, there's there's power differentials in this. Why shouldn't somebody in that previous area that didn't have uh, street lighting, didn't have a pedestrian crossing, 
didn't have uh, a library, didn't have, um, you know, that place where I have a good cup of coffee. Why should they be denied that any more than anybody else in a gentrified area? Um, gentrified area. But I would say, I mean, co-creation is, uh, I'm actually um, at supervising somebody in a PhD that's looking at just this term, so I won't, I could go on for a very long time. But there's co-creation, there's co-production, there's collaboration, there's all sorts of things there. And, you know, there's, I mean, Einstein's ladder of participation is a great kind of entry point into looking at different types of uh, working together with people, different types of participation. Um, co-creation, certainly in museum term, can mean a very specific thing. If it did get to that kind of identical output, I would really, I, I'm, this, the bitter part of me, the cynical part of me, um, and the inquiring part of me, the nosy part of me, would want to know, okay, so how did it actually get to that point? What was that co-creation really like? Was there really equity? Were there, where were the power differentials in that room? Who spoke the loudest? Who manufactured the conversation to go in a certain direction? So those, whilst I wouldn't necessarily disagree with it, I would really, you know, I would take a very critical disposition to actually how did it get to that point? Yeah, and that's sort of where, that's sort of where I ended up to with, with the research as well. And I think one way or another, you, I mean, you, you know, you cannot, um, well, none of us can can quarrel with what people want. We can't be holier than thou and say, "Oh, you should have done this," you know, because you're in ancient Rome, you know, um, um, or 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 wherever. So, point well made, Shannon. I saw you nodding vociferously. So, what's what what's your thought on this on this kind of hybrid question? I was just enjoying and taking notes, being a, a spectator to Kara's uh, articulate um, answer. Uh, I think, you know, from my viewpoint of uh, sort of curating and bringing together the exterior landscape sides of things, um, I've been in that position of watching um, solutions come in that I know are improvements, but may have a rather generic aesthetic. And we have to, um, or my, my take on it is that we need to reset the bone structure of a lot of these places. And we are in competition. If, if our goal is to do that, we're competing with such efficient systems and forces that um, in my view, tend to produce an overscaled um, result. Buildings that are blocks long, floor plates that are entire blocks. And that physical scale is my biggest challenge in an urban environment. If I was to pick one um, in terms of trying to make the urban environment as humane and locally oriented for daily life as possible. So I'll take a little bit of a dorky generic aesthetic um, that, that may not um, be as fine tuned as I wish. Um, if I think it's going to get that scale and that bone structure in there and the regular pedestrian crossings. The, the area where I don't feel we can compromise anymore in terms of uh, having, um, I guess it, it does cross over with the aesthetic, but the materiality not being local, we can't be compromising on that in some areas environmentally anymore. The materials coming from across the world mm -hmm. Um, there's aesthetic and cultural issues with that. There's also environmental issues with that. Right now, it shouldn't be, but it's more cost effective to bring materials across the world for my projects than it is to either salvage or locally uh, produce them. And then the last place that I have zero tolerance for, but don't always win on, is ecology. We cannot keep bringing species in from across the world and imposing them into ecologies that aren't involved for them, you know, especially in the context of the sixth mass extinction that's going on. No, absolutely. And I've, I've learned a tremendous amount um, living in a smaller town now and doing a lot mm -hmm. of walking in the, in the near countryside and seeing all of the species that both uh, flora and, you know, um, 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 animal life that has been brought here from elsewhere and um, that's a whole other story um yeah. 
but yeah, and you know, there's a there's a conundrum here because sometimes for in in this neck of the world, for, world for those as Cara knows, for those who are loyal to the London brick aesthetic, say in a redevelopment in Greater London or in England, you know where that brick is from? Not England. <laughs> it comes from China or elsewhere, and there's. That's why all of this is, you know, when you start breaking down these words and these ideas, they're incredibly complicated these days. So thank you very much. Um, we will be transitioning to, a, in a moment after, my, after Manish speaks, we'll be transitioning to Tigran on the second to last question. But Manish, what do you think about this whole, um, it's, it's part of my context keys thing. I mean, I think it's supposed integrity and, and, and also the question of co-creation to get there. Um, what do you what say you about what Cara and, and uh, Shannon have nicely summarized? Yeah, I agree with uh, most everything that Cara and Shannon have uh, discussed. I, and that had, that has me thinking that co creation has, of course, a lot of potential in in its approach slash methodology, and and can open up new spaces for collective creativity, but provided. Uh, the the equity and spatial and social justice are sort of you know ingrained in that framing of this uh, project. I mean, it could as as you know, a, a lot of co-creation attempts at generating a sustainable environment. But as you mentioned, Chuck, uh, you know, well, the concept of just sustainability that Julian Agiman gives us, right? What is sustainability if it's inequitable? What is sustainability which benefits? Uh, you know, one group over the other and burdens uh, uh, different groups in the urban fabric. So, but my, the cynical side of me is that, you know, when I hear of co-creation, I also think about, you know, co-optation of unsanctioned creations, right? And by, by unsanctioned creations, I mean uh, DIY urbanism, tactical urbanism, guerrilla urbanism, whatever you want to call it, right? Protest arts. So I'm thinking this is a way that the expert slash the state wants to integrate itself in this group just to control it and give it this frame of co-creation, right? So they want to co-opt these unsanctioned approaches to place making and they take away from some of its spontaneity and, and all the richness that comes with it, right? So I'm a little uh, concerned about how it unfolds. Uh, and I, 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 I'm, you know, and it also with the same, same, same with co-management uh, of natural resources where, uh, where you know, we allow indigenous people to manage their ancestral land, but without giving up the colonial framing and Western tools of land management. And this, you know, Libby Porter discussed this very well. So what do, we, what do they do? I mean, they, they have some autonomy, but within structures that are fairly oppressive, right? And, and they need to do the best of it. So yes, it's trendy, but if done right, uh, you know, I think it has potential. So I don't know if it fully answers your question. And the second no, piece- No, no, you did, yeah, yeah that's great. Go ahead. second yeah. piece of, you know, as you said, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile with uh, the, the contemporary reality with the, with the bones of the place, right? How do you do that? Uh, God, I mean, it's, it, the, what, what I've been reading more is, you know, uh, gentrification has changed in its uh, scale and scope and power. It's what we are talking, what we're calling super gentrification, because it now takes on global capital and has a lot of power to transform places. So places have always changed, as Kara said, right? But it was a different kind of change. It was perhaps more local change. But now these power, these forces are so powerful that more of the sameness is appearing everywhere. And you know Seattle, Seattle, Seattle is really, yeah. uh, you know, demonstrates that concept of sameness everywhere. So, yeah. No, thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate your long-term involvement in this project because I mean, we, we opened the door to these things, um, you know, um, almost three years ago now. So it's really, it's really fun to to uh, see this at, at this stage with the pandemic in between. Okay, so um, we have um, another 35 minutes. And what we'd like to do is our last question round is going to be Kara, Shannon, and Manish um, providing some visual representations of um, um, 
magic mixtures, um, but of, of place. Um, and we'll be doing that in about 15 minutes. But before we do that, Tigran's gonna take over and moderate the what was originally to be the fourth question, um, but now it just fits nicely here. And because we have um, some very accomplished folks in our audience with David and Doug, um, I think we'll, this is a good opportunity to involve them as discussants in, um, in, in some of the issues um, as well. So Tigran, 15, 20 minutes, go for Absolutely. it. Absolutely, thank you, Chuck. And uh, I, I see there's some kind of a divine light on me right now. It must be coming from the sage priestesses of uh, Delphi. If you know the history of Delphi, you know who was involved there. So uh, with all, I mean, uh, all apologies, David and Doug, for me, you are the high priestesses of Delphi. And I'm gonna try to pose a question, but more and more to see, uh, get a reaction from you guys on, on the whole concept of which Chuck and I discussed, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, how can we conceive these urban environments and approaches to livability after COVID-19, after the pandemic? How much has this changed? And when I look at your work, uh, I, uh, I remember Doug's good colleague, uh, uh, Dan Solomon, he, he uses this term longing to belonging, he's been writing about that. And I know Doug has, I mean, the concept of livability has been widely used. Uh, we, it's highly subjective, hardly measurable, but there are attempts to quantify livability. And Chuck has mentioned some of those, the Merson Consulting, the Economist Intelligence uh, uh, Unit, Monaco, and now recently the new one, which is called um, the Resonance Consultancy, saying that is the most holistic one, looking at 25 top cities, over 1 million, what are the best places to live, where they have used these categories of place, people, prosperity, promotion, and so on. But I remember, the two seminal works in different spectrum. One was Doug's when I was a postdoc in Michigan. He wrote a book about toward neighborhood and regional design commonplace as Doug knows as this is, I would see Doug, this still is your major work, your capital work. And you talked about the critical regionalism, the five points of level place, sense of nature, sense of history and sense of social place and limits to physical temporal boundaries and constructional craft. David wrote a beautiful book in the 70s called Psychology of Place. Both of them stand ground so much. And as I said once to Doug, when I was there, you know, we stand on the shoulders of big men and women. We don't really need to do anything. We just need to follow up what you have guys done and add to it. And David has wrote that the place is the result of relationship between actions, conceptions, and physical attributes. But most importantly, to un fully understand the place, David, another environmental psychologist, wrote that we need to know the kinds of behaviors that the place, uh, that that, that take place there. Uh, the physical parameters of the setting and the concepts people hold of these behaviors. So the big question is when, when we see these rankings of livability and then we see these different discourses, Doug and David, how our city should look like. My good friend, Richard Florida does it very much, um, goes out and tells us you know, how these environments are gonna look like from office environments from micro to macro scale. Uh, then there's a whole array of people that are uh, embedded in their ideological positions. Some are for sprawl. Look at this. Cities are terrible. Some are for density. The power of place is still in the cities. It's a wide question, but how would you two see livability and the power of place after COVID-19? What should we look at? What, what have we learned or what we haven't learned at all? Well, can I, um, can I start with that? Um, uh, many of you, uh, may not realize that um, after the work I did in the 70s on the psychology of place, I got drawn into rape and serial killing for some time. And I've only managed to, to give that all up, to come back to actually partly because of Tigran, putting me back into my first love of people's experiences of places. I've started to re, uh, revisit the whole literature and to rework uh, that, that book um, and finding that uh, so much is, is developing. But one, what's fascinating li listening to your discussions is the way in which what were very novel ideas in the 70s that had all sorts of names like participatory planning, which the British Labour government insisted all planning had to ha 
had to include or advocacy planning um, you're now uh, all sorts of new words have emerged and this whole range of different ideas about how you involve the public and um, the users what you're calling the community in the planning process it's fascinating to see how much that's part of your practice and if I can introduce a sort of slightly skeptical or, or cynical note really funny following up on Manish's his comments is is that there are some fundamental challenges in working within that framework that the COVID issue actually has illustrated very strongly. The first issue is, as a psychologist, one of the things we found, it's very difficult to get people to articulate in any sophisticated way um, what it is they feel and think about a place and indeed what they, they may want. Um, and architects and advocacy planners and people who wander around in, in co-creative uh, contexts um, bring to bear a perspective um, that inevitably filters out um, a, a person's involvement and activity. So I'm always very anxious um, about the notion that somehow or that you can build an understanding of what a place could look like or should look like um, from working uh, directly with the people. And that might seem strange as a psychologist, but it seems to me it's the humility of recognizing that designers actually have skills um, and that those are, are not what um, the average uh, person has. And if you think about it, the most uh, co-created places are shanty towns. Um, and when people have tried to work with those, they run into all sorts of problems of trying to introduce new perspectives uh, because it's so embedded within the context. Um, so that whole idea of operating within the with with what exists there is, is something that has to be dealt with very very cautiously. And of course, if the you've mentioned some of the fissures, some of the conflicts that are revealed in those processes but part of the problem is what happens if there's no community or if the community is very destructive or if the powerful power play forces within that environment are really um tr trying to take it off in in a totally uh, um, unlivable uh, direction and part of the problem within that that covid has really brought home to us is your when you're dealing with the present and the past, you have huge problems in thinking about the future. And um, there's already uh, all sorts of explorations about what's going to go on, for instance, in the city of London, when they've discovered that new technology means that you don't actually need to go into the office, um, uh, or certainly not regularly. And the office becomes a totally different type of, of context. How on earth um, do you plan for that and work with that you can't do it entirely with what people what people say and feel and think um, you have to bring to bear a perspective and this is where as a psychologist I've come in and I've found one of the big weaknesses of the many weaknesses of my 1977 book and um, the psychology of place was I never got to grips with what the fundamental role is of places in people's lives and I think that when you talk about livability, you have to get back to those psychological issues. And I went to um, some very commonly accepted sort of models, um, particularly, for instance, Maslow's model uh, of needs, which I think is, I, the term needs is very inappropriate. Um, and in fact, it, you have to think in terms of narratives and what people are aiming for. And in fact, the, the, the way in which people's involvement with places actually shapes their relationship to those places, what people can do about them. It's one of the reasons shanty towns are, survive so much. People have put themselves into it in a very direct physical way. So that how is our people's involvement in places, the, um, the basic uh, physiological, social needs, their uh, aspirations, um, the, the way in which they can create their identity and what those aspirations 
aspects of identity, social identity, personal identity, those whole, all those issues to me are missing uh, when we, um, we, we go for a walk with people. So um, that, that's, that's a sort of perspective on it. I've joined this. I've joined this because I'm struggling. I mean, writing the uh, the new version of the psychology of place, and it's been a damn nuisance. I'm started writing the psychology of place, and the COVID pandemic emerge, which totally changes. What is the home? What is the workplace? What is recreation? What are all these things in the context of, of a pandemic? So it's really, um, Great. I'm looking to you guys yeah. to help me to know Thank how you. to write this book. Maybe Doug can get in now and, uh, yeah. and help us yeah, from that the was American cool. perspective. Um, well, I remember advocacy planning back in the 80s, I actually uh, 70s. In late 60s, I went to Trenton, New Jersey, down the road from Princeton, where I was a grad student to start a... Um, community design center advocating for local folks in, a, in what was called the ghetto in the black community. And, and that sort of evolved and have us keep planning and you know participatory design. And then pretty soon we were talking about environmental issues, conservation, then sustainability, then now resilience, and, and more recently, climate change. I, I, I as important as COVID is, uh, and it's a product to some extent of climate change as all pandemics are. Um, I, uh, I think climate change is the big kahuna now, much bigger than COVID. And uh, we have to think about that when we think about a place. Um, places need to not only have all the wonderful attributes people have described, but um, they need to generate new renewable energy now they need to be dense so people walk more and drive less people bike more um so they need to have offensive and defensive strategies to deal with, with climate change which is going to make life very tough for our kids generation and our grandkids are going to go through royal hell as far as i can tell so that I, and my new commonplace, thank you, Tigran, was a, a key book, but my latest book, The Urban Fix, Resilient Cities in the War Against Climate Change, Heat Islands, and Overpopulation, I think is a more important book. And I hope some of you might find your way toward it. It's, um, I mean, heat, heat islands are already a big deal in much of the world, maybe not in Stockholm or Seattle, but, um, and overpopulation, my God, too many people. Thank you. Can we end up on this optimistic Malthusian uh, line? Uh, does anybody want to come in before sorry, can we I do just, the... I'm, I'm oh, sorry, David, go, yeah? I'm going to have to go in a minute. Can I just okay. contribute sure. to that about the, the environmental issues? One of the things I... I, one of the little papers I wrote that I'm developing is was called um, "Why Do We Leave It So Late?" And when you look at all national all disasters, you always find that they occur because people see the early warnings and they ignore them, and then it gets out of control. And it, it's it's true of whether you look at, at, at wars breaking out or whether people dealing with a building on fire and it becoming a, a disaster. And the reason um, for, for that is. I would argue is because people's relationships to places are an integral part of who they are. They, the, it shapes the, the, it shapes who they deal with, how they deal with them, and that cannot be changed by shouting at people or by giving people bicycle paths. The way in which that changes is by people changing their views of who they are. If they think they're environmentally friendly and they're going to do something about the environment then um, and that becomes part of their self-identity then they will change their behavior but you but most people the the day-to-day -day commute the um, the way they uh, shop or eat or how they relate to other people all of those are not little add-ons 
they are the very nature of if you say to them who are you that will those will all be part of what they deal with and within that is what i've called their environmental role what their relationship within society characterizes in terms of how they relate to their surroundings so that people may work in the same building or in the live in the same city but their relation to it ship to it is very different uh, because of the of their interactions and 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 who they're dealing with and it and that's the challenge is actually to get people to change the view of of who they are and um, that includes uh, awareness of the environment and that is not some simple fix that is a profound change in the nature of humanity Doug, there is a question for david maybe we can do it for david and doug the same question right yeah, yeah. I went before we do that. There is one person uh, before you go, David. There's some, and thank you for your comments, both of you. There is one person, but I wanted to say that Doug is Doug's new book is really good, and um, people, you know, sometimes uh, heat islands and, and and you know it sounds esoteric, but it is, and, and and the questions David raises about the holistic nature of all of this. I mean, these two items really resonate with me because I do. I did, this book couldn't be everything, but I did work in analogies with regard to the uh, the fires in Australia last year and um, some writings about Chernobyl and the whole um, shift in thinking and understanding about the forces that impact even a local area. So I really, uh, um, I love the global and all-inclusive way that you two gentlemen have, have, have reframed things. But before you go, David, there is a question from, um, Bianca Koenig, who's um, one of the patient 20 something people who have joined us and the group hasn't gotten any smaller so we must be doing something right. Um, uh, Bianca asked whether the pandemic makes the value of those, she says those spaces more clear and I assume, I assume she means traditional spaces. So I, maybe Bianca, if you wanna chime in and clarify your question or either in the chat window or unmute yourself. Um, Hi, you thanks, so, thanks so much for the opportunity oh. to participate. Uh, I was just listening to David earlier and he was he was describing how, and then the pandemic hit and it, it, it affected the research and the progress on the book. And as he was speaking, I had this thought pop in where, or does it make the value of these spaces more clear? where, um, so I don't know if that helps make the question clear, but that is along those lines. Yeah, sorry, I'm just reading the, um, uh, the, the other message about um, um, the uh, social practice in arts um, <laughs> developing um, their experience. Of, um, I mean, that, that's a whole other dimension and is a very, very powerful one. and. and Part of what I was talking about, though, is is our difficulty dealing with the future, because one of the things that's happened with um, Black Lives Matter is the total uh, re-examination of of the history that is reflected in places. And art has been a very much important part of that. And art is clearly a way out of it um, of 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 dealing with that by recognizing that the art forms uh, in in place can develop things but in re in relation to the value um, of of places the 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 from a psychological point of view a lot of people are drawing attention to the um underlying uh, social disease uh, that um the pandemic is is sort of leaving behind particularly with with often younger generations um and and that and that there is a whole groundswell of of mental disturbance um, that uh, a colleague, a, a psychiatrist, has just written a book about. Really, sort of developing the argument um, that that there is that we've not really recognised the after effects the of of this trauma, and that draws attention to people's access to places, of course, and. Um, Tigran and I are supervising a student who's looking at loneliness and the, the role of places within that. Um, and the whole, it, it, it's the, the whole issue of, of how 
social networking and the and and the online life has changed relationships and the and is is changing the nature of what we expect of places it, it's fascinating in britain now that is coming out of lockdown i was in liverpool uh, yesterday people were everywhere um the it, and and london is, is 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 the same partly because people are not using public transport so the the roads are absolutely crowded with private vehicles um, uh, but any open space, particularly on a sunny day, which is relatively rare in, in the north of England, um, people are really uh, taking advantage of that. But that what they're taking advantage of is contact with others and the way they can express themselves in terms of their, their relationships and their developing um, organization of, of who they are, they are and those social processes and I think people are becoming more aware of the role that certain sorts of places have in that potential that possibility in a sense public places are becoming um, more significant possibly um, but there are so many levels to this and I am so grateful to you to uh, as ever to Tigran the the, the puppet master who brings us all together um, that uh, that you've allowed me to sit in on on all the exciting things you're doing I've got a long list of your books that I'm going to have to get into my I, my shelves are already buried under the books that have been published in the last 10 years or so that I've got to try and get an, on top of for, for my new edition but unfortunately the timing from your point of view um, interferes with a lot of things going on here at the moment yeah. Um, yeah. partly because we're opening up and family are coming around at last I'm yeah. the, my grandchildren so I'm sure you'll forgive me if I I have to leave and go and see them but I, it's been an absolute delight listening to you and having yeah. this opportunity to uh, thanks very much David um, thank you so much before you go I want to tell you something very quick and that is um, we're doing a, a panel for the um, International Seminars on Urban Forum in Glasgow coming up in a few weeks. And um, one of the participants um, guess what his um, contribution in, in talking about the usefulness of this book will be. You probably know him, Conrad Kickert at, in Buffalo. Conrad wants to talk about how this book that we're talking about today relates to Cantor and his theories from the 70s. Yeah, well, so. <laughs> I mean, I, well, that's, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. It's also somewhat embarrassing because I did manage to, I'd lost, I had to get a copy off eBay because um, I didn't have one because it's over 40 years ago. Um, and I have to tell you, it's, it's a remarkably limited book. Um, oh, well, um, but the but it, it's fascinating. It's you know yeah. you, 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 these things go out there and people take them seriously. I, as yeah, I, I know I, you guys are finding with your publications, it's yeah, it's, uh, I know it's great stuff. It's great stuff. So it's been a delight meeting you. And, yeah, uh, very nice I to see you. I hope to meet um, you in the flesh in the not too distant future. Yeah, well, I'm not too far away. I'm in, I'm in Newbury, so I hope to see you soon. Um, yeah, great. Okay, keep in touch. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I, you thank know, you. I have to um, leave pretty, I have to leave too. I'm sorry, oh, Chuck. And thank Pugin, you, Doug. Oh, but it's a pleasure. David. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Team. Doug. Maybe we'll see you yeah. in Seattle next we'll week. We'll meet again. Hey, yeah. Tigran, I'm going to that conference in Carmel, Indiana. Is Peter Amlin still coming to that? No, he's uh, he's got a replacement there because he has got COVID-19, so I don't think he's, they're going to let him into the country. Oh, it's too bad. So right. he, uh, one of our former PhD students is replacing him, Doug. Uh, okay. Ryan Locke. You remember Ryan. He'll be there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, good luck, everybody. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Take care. Um, okay. So um, our final chapter here is to do the, the, the um, Tigran-led Delphi tradition, and that is close with a round of representations, as I mentioned earlier, photos, sketches, um, of the panelists that um, speak to the issues at hand. So we we had a set of questions. If you if each of you wants uh, you know to comment on the post pandemic reality in the context of discussing your photo, yeah, Cara, why don't you do it with your photo? Um, it won't be um, in the context though, of the photo, but I will as I find the yeah yeah yeah, yeah. let's the photo do that. PowerPoint, unfortunately, so I have to. Go oh yeah yeah no that's fine yeah no that's um, perfect. But why but, uh, why don't yeah, let me just finish and, and I'll just say so that the, the rest of the group um, um, stands while Cara is beginning to share her screen. 
Um, the charge to the pan the three panelists, Manish, um, Shannon, and um, Cara, was to um, provide a photo or a sketch to share on screen from their perspective what best summarizes the magic mixture of an evolving inclusive city consistent with the issues we've been discussing. So why don't we go uh, Cara, Manish, and Shannon in this effort. And Cara's already sharing the screen, so go for it, please. I don't know why my camera's gone off, but I'll sort that in a moment. Um, one thing I did want to say on the post-pandemic city, I think I, what I've noticed is that with, you know, connection to place and the importance of their being in place and belonging has been really heightened. Um, and you see that by people wanting to express themselves still in the public realm, but doing it through the medium of their window pane or their balcony or their rooftop, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, myself and um, friend and colleague Anita McCohen are starting a, uh, a project around trauma-informed placemaking. So looking at place post the syndemic of 2020 and what our relationship is in there and, and understanding or, or saying that as placemakers, we need to have an understanding of trauma. The image that you see here really encapsulates for me exactly sort of why I do the work that I do. It's a community in a social housing estate in East London. Um, there's a lot of residents that have been there for many years, generations. There's a lot of residents that are new that have been uh, socially cleansed, turfed out of other social housing in London and put into this community. Um, without ceremony, um, uh, without support. Um, and what was organised here is by a group called the Drawing Shed, uh, was a community lunch. And the person who's standing up at the head of the table is an artist um, from Mexico. He's telling the story of how his family came from Mexico to be in the UK. And you've got something like over 70 different languages spoken in this particular area. You've got all sorts of different generations. I think the youngest person there was four. The oldest was around 94. And what came out of this conversation, uh, which all this sort of artist intervention conversation that Pablo sort of started, um, was a conversation around place, around politic, around identity, around life narrative. And the politic was hyper-local to drain issues on the estate, uh, social support on the estate to the macro geopolitics as well. So using just this really quite simple process, how that, that exploded out from that process, the conversation, and then the action that came from that. This, this image was just the starting point of a real, you know, different level of consciousness for that community. Excellent. Are you ready, Manish? <laughs> mm, I can be. Uh, let me see, share screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. I just want to get my presenters now. So for those of you who are from Seattle are probably familiar with this. Uh, this is the 500 block of East Pine Street, located in the Pike Pine section of Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood, which has historically been uh, the city's gay, gay neighborhood. Uh, so this block of 500 Pine was demolished on November 2007 to make way for new luxury residential development. As you can see, the block housed an eclectic set of small and local businesses in a series of brightly painted spaces, including bars, restaurants, and shops. The bulk of the block is only one story tall with the exception of a three-story apartment building of affordable housing on, on the left of the screen. Of the seven demolished buildings, only a, ha only a couple re relocated elsewhere in the neighborhood. And one, one of those has since been you know, uh, shut down, the others are, closed for good actually. And the owner of the Manre gay bar, which is on the right of your screen, he's, he said, and I'll quote, you can't take the spirit of the place and try to transplant it. So he would rather just close the bar and not move it somewhere else. 
So after the demolition and before new construction began, the Great Recession hit and the property ended up spending three years, first as an empty gravel lot and then as a paid parking lot. Uh, finally, uh, a generic six story building uh, that maximizes the built up potential of the site using monolithic massing uh, came up. It has two large businesses on the, on the first floor now, and those are called condo retails. One of them, uh, I believe is a fitness center and another one is some kind of dentist. Uh, in place of these seven uh, small businesses, at least two of them were immigrant run. So very quickly, residents were outraged by this change. They saw it as a final straw in a long process of gentrification that had been erasing the campy, uh, grungy, slightly wild, but very local flavor of the neighborhood. Block by block, uh, block after block was being turned from you know, beloved businesses or community institutions into high density development with larger and more upscale retail on the first floor and luxury residences above. Many felt that the entire character of the neighborhood unique to Seattle and even rarer throughout the country was being rapidly lost and replaced with uh, simply a denser version of every, everywhere else. And this concern plays out in the image that you see. Uh, a, a bunch of local artists got together uh, and, uh, and uh, digitally created the block after it was demolished. So what you see here is a digital recreation of the block on a poster. Uh, and they had a party or sort of a memorial and remembrance of the block, you know. And it says, you know, uh, it, they did it to pay tribute to a, a vibe that it embodied. And it was all digitally reconstructed. Uh, uh, to just sort of remember what was being lost, you know, the old Seattle, like what vanishing Seattle, because Chuck and Tigran, you mentioned that in your in your book as well. Uh, so after that, another loosely uh, organized group, People's Parking Lot, uh, uh, reclaimed the block for community garage scales and uh, uh, temporary art installations. Uh, they worked with the city and the, the city took away the surface parking permit from the developer before the construction. So they created all this sort of you know, reclaim, reclaiming of, of the space for public uses. So this is it. It's not a, it's a sad uh, photo that this is what we're losing in Seattle. And I thought for me, it sums up the context very well. This is the context that defined the grungy, unsanitized, slightly whimsical counterculture capital hell. Uh, and not uh, the one that's replacing it, which is a lot more manufactured, a lot more uh, predictable and such. So I, I wrap up here. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I remember that and, I, and, and you know, because you've written about it as well, that yeah. um, after this time there, there became a regulatory scheme in Capitol Hill that awarded the retention of facades and so on and so forth and allowed additional height. You know, the question of whether that preserve the the relative character you know right, it depends right. on who it depends the on who, yeah you know yeah. the whole story yeah 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 and so it's just one example of um, an attempted regulatory fix that was probably incomplete so shannon why don't you close us out here um in the next uh five minutes or so with uh, with your image thank you no pressure well maybe i'll close us out in a little more <laughs> little uh hopeful note um, for me and, and the uh, example I'm going to show hopefully embodies this, but I'm, I see some good things coming out of the insights that and sort of the mood change that I'm sensing in my work that's coming from the pandemic. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'll tell you what this aerial photo is of in a second, but I did want to mention we do a lot of work for West Coast North American based tech companies, campuses, office environments that are designed to recruit young mobile professionals from all over the world. So it's a fascinating kind of glimpse at um, those well funded um, uh, attempts to predict the future and where um, people who could choose to live anywhere and work anywhere, what are they looking for and how is that changing? Even before the pandemic, 
uh, office districts that felt like single note office districts, as we all know, were starting to get a little anxious about their value and desirability to um, the most to creative people, right? Um, and I think people just in general are starting to realize that our cities, especially in North America, especially newer cities that are designed with these giant single use components, office districts, retail districts, single family areas, freeways, these big things that are designed to do just one thing at a time really well, they're not fun to be around. And during the pandemic, when many of us stayed in a neighborhood or a five block radius suddenly who had been, maybe we'd been traveling a lot around or commuting from one of these components to another in our cities. We started to realize how important it is to have access within a 15 minute walk of many different kinds of environments. And that's exciting to me. And I'm seeing my clients who are tech companies, um, whether they're trying to recruit people for office environments or laboratories or housing, wanting to mix things up more and break down the scale. So this uh, aerial is of a public project. It's not a tech project. It's in the Hunters Point Bayview neighborhood south of San Francisco, a predominantly black neighborhood that's been underserved for, for decades. Um, and you can see the major roadway along the waterfront there that's Ennis Boulevard. It is designed for regional flow. It is not for serving the local people there. It is to get folks to bypass through the neighborhood that are commuting from home to work or from industry to city center. And there was a design competition for what is on the water side of that road, uh, India Basin Shoreline Park. Uh, this was in 2016. And there was, as many of you remember, this trend for a while to make these spectacular waterfront parks that would be award-winning. And they're all about these big civic gestures because people were really excited about reclaiming waterfronts. We, uh, I'm gonna go to this next image. Our entry, uh, which we thought would, would never win, um, but we wanted to talk about it, our entry into this competition uh, was to propose that we knit the neighborhood back together as a locally um, expressive landscape that uh, is more physically, I guess, um, inspired and produced by uh, daily life and daily access for the folks that live in the project housing up the hill to what used to be their main street and could be again, it has lots of great shoebox retail spaces there. Um, connecting the isolated project housing with the retail district that they can't even cross the street to get to right now. And with nature, a uh, restored shoreline and um, access for all the kids. There's a tremendous number of kids in, the, um, in those, that public housing. Uh, get those kids to the water safely and give them lots of opportunities to do that. And our proposal was that if you start here and create this framework for uh, a mix together, a mixing and connected local ground, then it will be a place that people would want to come from other places to come see because it'll be more pleasant for everyone. And we find in general with our work, especially in the last several years, more and more of our clients that would have wanted a spectacular office building at some point a few years ago are responding to this kind of approach of starting with what's there locally and breaking down the scale and emphasizing regular daily life, which is kind of timeless and common sense, but uh, isn't in the big bones of a lot of our Western and North American cities today. So I think the pandemic's helped with that <laughs> is, is sort of my uh, relevant point, I hope. Yeah, I know it's, 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 it's particularly relevant. I must say that, um, that I think that's kind of consistent with um, the esteemed David Cantor's comments. I mean, I, we write about in the book, some you know, flagship projects that, that um, Jan Gale's firm likes to advertise, but I, you know, even in before the pandemic, there's a certain humility to use your term, Shannon, that they've had to adapt um, in, in and around the Villa 31 project in South America, where they were charged with essentially reconnecting a favela, a, you know, a, a arrival city with contemporary Buenos Aires. And they had to immerse 
and understand what made the the organic uh, arrival messy uh, spontaneous city work and then before they ever thought about building the bridges across whatever the divider line might be and I, I see um, I see you've you know you've identified some parallel points well there's about um, there's about 10 people who are not us still with us I want to give even though we're over time um, and some of you need to go back to work in the Pacific Northwest uh, I want to um, make sure there's if you have any questions please put them in the chat window those of you who are still here I don't see anything just yet um, I think then I will mention that if anyone um, who's intrigued by all of this and does want to uh, obtain a copy of Sustaining a City's Culture and Character, it's it's out there. Um, as I've said, we've had some supply chain challenges, both um, in, in particularly in Europe, in UK and the United States, which are beginning, if not are now unwound. So you should be able to get a copy. I mention it only be, as a one-stop shop to raise so many of the issues that we've discussed today. And I, I do think it's useful in, in that regard. I wanna thank Kara and Shannon and Manish as always, and Marta for running the show, for all of you who've um, taken the time out of your days to attend. And I'll kick it back to Tigran who invented this whole machine and um, maybe you have some closing words to run um, from yeah, the center's I just, perspective. I just want to thank you Chuck for moderating this and uh, feeling a bit sad because we after the three years of the centric pandemic came and we had almost around 200 events we were going at light speed but somehow we just got frozen in place as everybody else did uh, many good things have done been done as Manish knows he was part of Delphi we had the Athena talks consisting only of female scholars uh, but we are back and I think we'll we'll end it up in a good note and if you are interested I'll send in the chat um, the videos that have been uploaded by our video production manager that is now uh, enjoying his uh, retirement uh, retiring from weather underground and from uh, Grateful Dead uh, so you'll find a lot of interesting videos that will hold time for sure some excellent speakers most of our uh, one of the latest ones was when in Richard Florida was at the center so I'm really grateful to all of you uh i don't know chuck we can't promise too many of these events we'll try to do the best we can before the closure of five years of the center on the 16th of september but i think we'll be able to do something until the end of the year and there will be a conference a specific uh, special zoom conference somewhere probably in september to commemorate the the closure of the center or the, at least these first five years so i'll let you know i think we'll, we'll have something very interesting on that yeah. probably with partners uh, you know, Chuck gave a very good, great speech recently at Zagreb, Croatia, and I have partners there with one of the leading uh, architectural and urbanist, urban magazines that would like to organize this conference for us so it can open up a little bit for the Eastern Central Europe. So I'll keep you posted. And uh, thank you all for the great panelists. And we had two sage Pythia priestesses in in the form of Doug Kelbo and David Cantor. Wow. So I think we're all happy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you again, and we will uh, we'll see some of you hopefully in the United States um, during a quick visit very soon, and uh, the rest of you here in the UK and, and back to Stockholm soon. I I hope someday. So um, thank you again, and.